Mm-hmm. Let's turn the corner here because I because I don't want people to get the sense that all is all is gloom and doom. Right. Uh, a lot of your book talks about ways to address this. Certainly, I, I would think that one way to begin addressing it is simply to acknowledge it right. as something that that needs to be addressed. Right. Um, but it's tricky, right? Because we have ex- think about explicit bias. Mm-hmm. We can legislate against that. We have right. legislated against that. Right. Think about bias in in housing. Right. We can say no. You have to. You know, you you can't not rent to. The Eberhards, because they are black, that's illegal. That right. is against the law. So that's right. explicit bias we can legislate against. Right. Implicit bias. You it's can't harder. Re- yeah, it's hard. Right. You can't really you can't really legislate against it. Um, and yet it's still there. So so let's talk about um, uh, one interesting example you had uh, has to do with with housing. Let's talk right. about different elements of housing. Uh, sale price of homes, for instance, was mm-hmm. kind of shocking to me as well. Yeah, so we did a study where we were interested in the role that race played um, in the housing market. And, you know, there have been lots of these studies done by sociologists, where, but they're like sort of big correlational studies yeah, kind of uh-huh. showing, you know, homes in this area, you know, are worth, you know, less than homes in this other, that kind of thing. What we wanted to do is to take the same exact home right. and have it, um, you know, be a home that's occupied either by a black family right. or a white family. Everything else is identical, right. right? About the home, the features of the home and so forth to see if you're given the same house, the same, you know, sort of, uh, you know, home to consider, like how, what is the role that race is playing in how you would evaluate that home? And we found that they evaluated the home more negatively when we asked them to um, imagine uh, the neighborhood surrounding that home, uh right? So we didn't give them any information about the neighborhood. We just said, imagine, you know, what the neighborhood is like. They imagined a neighborhood that was more run down. They imagined a neighborhood that was more crime ridden, uh, poorer schools, uh, fewer financial um, institutions, so on and so forth. So it, so it was, um, y- you know, just with a single black family, you know, we can have all of these associations right. kind of come online and then influence our decision making. It influences whether we're going to buy that house, how much we want to pay for that home. It influences, you know, sort of even even how much work needed to be done on the house before you could put it on right. the market. To me, what was interesting was was the price because that's so easy to measure. Mm-hmm. And there was uh, what, about a twenty thousand dollar drop right. in if the house had been inhabited by an African American family rather than by a white family. Yeah. So simply imagining yeah. neighbors yeah. who are black led yeah. that home to be yeah. worth twenty two thousand yeah. dollars less. Yeah. 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 And it's and but we've seen this before. I mean, it's 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 again, it, it, it's a combination of both our nature and the society we live in. It's that there always is this. Uh, Certain view of outgroups. Yeah. Uh, there, you know, we have in groups and outgroups. Obviously, sturdy finding in all of social science. Um, but every once in a while, the outgroups are characterized as dirty. Yeah. As ver- you know, we see it now in some of the language and politics. Now, uh, those people are disgusting for immigrants. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Vermin, or you for the whole idea of oh, we don't want those dirty Jews living around us. Yeah. Um, and so it's such a pernicious problem. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about some solutions. Let's talk about Airbnb, the, the, the start, billion dollar startup that right. is turning people's guest rooms into youth hostels. Um, they experienced um, a problem with implicit bias, but they actually took some action. Tell us about that. They did take action. So it's interesting. I mean, this is a, a interesting case. You're sort of saying historically how this has happened to a variety of groups, and that this has happened yeah. in housing in particular. Yeah. And um, even though we have laws to legislate right. against it, right? right? So, so now you, you have, you know. We're, we're looking at homes in this new way and using this new platform, and it's migrated online, right? Right, right. And so, and so now we're having to deal with how do we confront uh, this new kind of bias um, on this new kind of platform? Right. And so they, um, yeah, they, they sought me out and sought other researchers out to right. try to help them to curb profiling on the uh, platform. There, there was. Um, you know, uh, both lots of complaints, you know, on social media mm-hmm. uh, from African Americans in particular com- complaining that um, they were being denied, um, 
you know, uh, th th that they weren't uh, being accepted basically as guests uh, for homes that, you know, that they wanted to stay in because of their race. Mm -hmm. And there seemed to be some evidence of this. There was research conducted by uh, researchers at Harvard who was show you know, showed this. And then mm -hmm. Airbnb, you know, the company itself actually um, started looking at this right. and found evidence um, that, uh, you know, black, uh, you know, uh, guests were, were being turned away at higher rates than others. Right. And, so. But, but they, 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 they took some action, though. Which they gives did. Us, which gives us some hope. They, they did. Yeah. I mean, so they um, they hired someone to, uh, to, to come in to uh, try to um, sort of, uh, they were trying to, to attack it on many different levels, and so they had a whole legal team sort of working out the legal issues mm -hmm. with it. They also, um, uh, develop this uh, community pact that that people would sign. Right. Uh, it's basically a you know a pledge sure. to abide by the policies of right. Airbnb, which right. is that you don't discriminate. And right. so, in order to actually use the platform, you have to sign off on. Right. You have to agree to this. Right. And so that came out of this, and sure. which was a good thing. Yeah. Um, and then they also have um, now this anti-discrimination uh, team where they're working to monitor um, this and to try to figure out ways to protect uh, people people from it. They even, like if guests get turned away, they promise those guests that they would find oh, other ho uh -huh. housing for them. Uh -huh. And so, so they have taken, uh, you know, many, many steps uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to address it. But it's a difficult thing to address, right? And right. Which is why the anti-discrimination group is an ongoing group, sure. you know, so they're, they're meeting right. all the times to right. make sure that they keep, right. keep their eye right. on it. But, I, but that left me hopeful that you yeah. have this big billion dollar company that is actually taking what seems to be pretty serious mm -hmm. uh, steps. And, and, yeah. and, and certainly the response to the initial complaints, not, what are you talking about, this is not really going on, is to say, let's look at it, whoa, the data show this is going on, let's right. do something different. Now, right. what, what you're talking about there in some ways, and you write about this, I think more broadly in the book, is the, the importance of norms. Yeah. Um, and um, and that's a dicey one too because if we if the norm is oh my gosh we're all wired for bias we're all um, you sort of let people off the hook um, you well, risk letting people off the hook saying well go right. ahead talk to me maybe not right well I mean I think yeah. the thing there is that simply because we um, have a proclivity for yeah. this or that um, we're vulnerable to it that doesn't mean we can do nothing like right. that we are not responsible that that there's no action to be taken. You know, that's something that's sure. altogether different because there are things we can do. I mean, even though we're vulnerable yeah. to bias, yeah. you know, we, we can manage it. There, there are things that we can do to put the brakes on it. And, and we could talk about yeah, some of those let, things. Let, let, let's talk about some of those things because, because it, but, but again, I think that what, I think what Airbnb is doing in some ways with the, with the, even the, even the, the, the act of pledging right. um, is establishing a norm. It is. That's not how we do it around here. Right. Um, and norms can be very norms powerful. Can be very, very powerful. So right. let's talk about some other um, ideas that have that have worked. There's another one dealing with housing and neighborhoods right. of uh, 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 operation called Next Door, which right. is a really, I think, a very hopeful example of how to solve the, uh, how well, to get out of the problem. Well, it is. I mean, it was the so, same kind of thing. Yeah. They were worried. Uh, I mean, their whole thing is a platform. It's an online platform for neighbors to get together to share information. And, right, you know, right. So I, I, I subscribe to Net, Next Door in my neighborhood. And so yeah. it's like, oh, I'm looking for babysitting. Oh, I, exactly. my, cat, my cat ran away. Right. Or, you know, oh, there's somebody, you know, my time, my, this morning my tires were slashed beware right. uh, so there's a right. platform for people talking about what's happening in the neighborhood but they right. notice they notice bias right they notice profiling right. on, on on the uh, platform where people would look out their window and they would see a black man usually it was a black man in an otherwise white neighborhood and they would go you know to their computer and start you know, calling out to all the neighbors, suspicious person in the neighborhood, you know, look out, beware. Sometimes they would call the police. And, um, and, and oftentimes this was, you know, for in cases where the person wasn't doing anything, right. you know, any, nothing suspicious. It was his social category uh, that was suspicious, that he was a black man that was suspicious. Right. So they're trying to figure out, well, what do we do? How right. do we curb this? So um, the uh, one of the founders of Nextdoor, you know, contacted me and other researchers and also read through the literature to try yeah, to figure out yeah. how do we curb this and yeah. came to the conclusion, well, what we need to really do is to slow people down. 
Exactly. Right? We need to slow them down so that they don't just get on there, because exactly. they're in a heightened state, right? They exactly. want to alert their neighbors right, right. away, um, and they're, they're worried, they're threatening, they want to protect everyone. And so it's one of those situations where you know, bias can, can, you know, can, can get the best of you and affect um, how you're making decisions. Right. So, but the issue was with the slowing down is um, that it was kind of against um, you know, w you know, the main <laughs> philosophy behind building these tech products. They're all about removing friction. It is. And, you're, and what yeah. you're saying is a solution is introducing friction. Yes. So in the next door example, so, explain, what they, explain what they did. So they ended up saying, okay, this is an important problem. Right. We're going to have to take the risk, introduce this friction. So, so now when you hit the crime and safety tab as a mm -hmm. neighbor and you try to go right. shout out to everyone, right. suspicious black man right. or whatever it is, um, you have to slow down. You have to look at a checklist and uh -huh. go through this checklist. There are three items on the checklist. Yeah. Um, you're asked, what is it about the person's behavior right. that right. makes them suspicious? It right. can't be black man. It can't be social, the social category. Right. You're asked um, to describe the, the, the person in detail. Right. Uh, it can't be, you're just describing, you're saying black man as a description. It has to be detailed so that you know, you're know you not sweeping all these people under this broad category and making them all vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the third uh, thing was that they defined what racial profiling was. A lot of people didn't know what the definition was. They didn't even know they were engaging in profiling. Right, right. So just that information right. was good. And then they said, this is prohibited on the platform. So again, you're setting a norm for exactly. what is permissible behavior, right? right? right. And right. they found with this checklist, but first I'll, I'll tell you, they, they have this saying there. So you know, you've seen these signs. I, I think in um, New York, you see them in subways as well as in uh, airports. If you I, see something, say something. I was, I was thinking about that. On, literally, on the, we're, we're talking in New York. Yeah. I live in uh -huh. Washington, D.C. I came up on Amtrak, and uh -huh. on Amtrak, they have this, if you see something, say something. If right. you see something, say something. But you have a better approach to that. Well, they did. Oh, so, yeah, so, your, they, uh -huh. so they modified uh -huh. that. So it's, if you see something suspicious, say something specific. Say that again, because I think that is great guidance. If you see something suspicious, say something specific. Uh, yeah. And so that's what they were shooting for. And they found just with this checklist, slowing people down, adding the friction, yep. they were able to curb profiling by over 75% yeah, on the platform. That's really, I mean, that's really extraordinary. And, and, and again, what, 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 left me, what, left me, what left me hopeful here is that, at least one reader, bias is something that happens sort of quickly and almost beneath our cognition. Mm -hmm. And what you're suggesting here is, wait a second, slowness mm -hmm. might be the way to eradicate or at least mitigate some of it. Right. Cognition, actually thinking right. might be the solution, which would be a lovely idea in right. general. <laughs> <laughs> that, that thinking is the solution. So you saw something similar with your, so you've done a lot of work with the Oakland Police Department. Right. Um, which was the subject of a, I think of a civil rights lawsuit and it right. had a consent decree or something. and. Um, you saw some changes with the Oakland Police Department that are in this vein. Tell us about that. Yeah, so there, there are changes that uh, we were involved in and there are changes that predated us that um, both actually get at this issue of slowing down. A lot, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you can't expect to give a police officer a checklist in the right. middle of this, that, and the right. other, and you know, they have to make split-second decisions right. so it doesn't work. Right. But, it, but it turns out these things work um, in more cases you know, than we uh, want to believe. And it certainly works with police officers too. And so they found that, so before we came uh, on board, they found that, um, you know, with their foot pursuit policy, yeah. you know, they, they, you know, they would, you know, the original policy, they, they would chase people um, even when they lost sight of the person, mm -hmm. even when the person went into an enclosed space uh, where they couldn't be seen and so forth. And um, that, that was leading to a lot of problems and, yeah. and, and people getting hurt and so forth. Including so, police officers themselves. Yes, including the police yeah. officers. Um, so what they did was they changed the policy so um, they would, uh, if the person, if they lost sight of the person, if the person went into some un un you know, sort of enclosed space, they were not allowed to follow them into it anymore. Um, they were told to, you know, to slow down. They were told to step back. They were told to call for backup exactly. and so forth. And so, so again, slowing down. Um, so they found that with that simple change, they were able, they used to have uh, eight to nine officer involved shootings a year. 
Now they have had eight officer-involved shootings in the last five years right. with that change in policy. Right. Um, so, and then uh, you, you mentioned officer safety as well. Mm -hmm. um, so officers used to get hurt going sure. into these situations and, and the injuries uh, went down, shot down by 75%. Mm -hmm. so, so small changes. That also, by the way, protects officers from bias, right? Because sure. if you're in a situation, you can't see the person, it's dark, you're in an enclosed space, you don't know what's going to happen. You have to, you know, make a decision really right. quickly. Right. Um, and you're, you're fearful, you're threatened, all of this. Um, you know, these are the situations that uh, lead to bias affecting your decision making. Right. So, so you can protect people and, and, and you can get the protection from bias uh, for free. Right, so, and I and it's a uh, and 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 one of the things that I thought was compelling about one of the many things compelling about the book was some of your you you relate to certain conversations you had with police officers. Mm -hmm. I'm remembering one of a man in the Oakland PD who uh, had a scar on his head. Uh, oh. um, and tell me about some of your conversations with with police officers because I, initially there was some skepticism um, about here's this woman coming in to tell us what to do. Yeah. I I mean, there's a lot of skepticism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us how you responded to that, and uh, be, be, because because again, um, it, as, as policing, uh, I, I, there's being a police officer is an incredibly difficult job. Mm -hmm. It's a very very difficult job, and right. I think that some of this the bias mitigation makes it easier for police officers to do their job. Yeah. Yeah. So, to, yeah. So, 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 but I'm interested in sort of your conversations with police officers and how they responded to you, perhaps how you began to convince them that this was actually good for the entire system. Yeah, that's a great question. So that took some time. So yeah. we were there a couple years and then we released a report uh -huh. and they didn't like the report we released at all. You know, we found you sure. know, the racial disparities, right. the, the typical, right? Yeah. That, um, you know, that they were um, stopping more African-Americans mm -hmm. disproportionately, right? right. So, um, and, you know, uh, searching them and, and, and so forth. But they felt like they had good reason for that. They felt like they had um, what they call intelligence that led them to make the right, stops right. on those people. And those were the people committing crimes. And right. of course, they would have to stop them. And so that would explain right. uh, why the disparities were there and it wasn't right. bias. Right. And so they were upset with us, the Stanford researchers, because we were leading people to believe that they were racist or that they were biased and mm -hmm. that they weren't. Uh, they were just doing their gut jobs. Um, they were doing, they were engaged in good policing. So we sat down with them after we uh, produced the report and, you know, sort of talked to them about the concerns. And uh, the, the big concern was this whole thing that, that they had intelligence on these people. Sure, they, uh -huh. they had evidence, right, you know. So, right. so we said, okay, well, we, we actually couldn't track that at the time. The department wasn't keeping that information. Right. We can't analyze data we don't have. Right. So let's figure out how to track it. So right. we, we ended up, so officers, every time they make a stop um, of, of someone in mm -hmm. Oakland, they have to complete a form that, that says why they made the stop right. and the location of the stop and right. so forth. So what we did is we simply decided to add an, an, another question to uh -huh. that form. Was that stop, is the stop intelligence led, yes or no? So for every single stop, they have to stop and they have to think about whether it. uh -huh. it's intel led. Do uh -huh. they have credible you know, right. information to tie that person right. to a crime? Right. And so we found that simply adding that question made a difference. Right. So so now every time it was like changing their mindset. So you, you're, you're getting them to, to think about evidence and to not to act on intuition exactly. about who's committing right. crime. Right. And then they're also thinking about, well, what stop, you know, what, which are the stops um, are, are stops that are high priority stops for the department? Which are the kinds of stops that we want, that we right. care about? Right. Um, and, and how many of those stops have I made? And so it, it changes the calculus around this, right. right? And so we found that before that question was added, uh, I think Oakland had about 32,000 stops that they made of people across the city. Uh -huh. But after that question, they had only 19,000 stops. Wow. Uh -huh. So it was a 40% drop That's significant, in the yeah. number of stops. Yeah. And a lot of this was due, again, to the pause, to the reflection, to the thinking, do I need to do this? It's friction and thinking. I mean, yeah. adding that question is introducing friction into yes. the decision making. And it's also forcing de uh, deliberateness, at least. Yes. Deliberation, something right. like that, yeah. Right. So I think that's actually really powerful. And that, and that, that got me thinking that, that, okay, what we need to do here is we need to slow down 
Right. Just to think, introducing friction in systems can actually be beneficial to the right. entire system. And it also has this cascading effect is if there are fewer unnecessary stops, police officers are freed up to do more important work. Right. Uh, maybe that begins ever so slowly building greater community trust and, and so forth. Right. There, there right. are other solutions that you, that you talk about here. I want to talk about one that doesn't work. Okay. Um, and then we'll move to other ones because right. I think there are, there are a, a lot of like uh, more uh, lightweight solutions that are, are really interesting. Yeah. Some people will go out there, some people will go out and say, uh, basically white people will say, we should be colorblind. Right. Or the more, you know, sort of jarring comment, oh, I don't see color. Right. Um, color, so we want to have a colorblind society. What's wrong with that? <laughs> well, what's wrong with it is that uh, often, I mean, so people yeah. say this because they want to be free of bias. Right. And how can you be biased if you're colorblind? Right. Um, and, and that this would lead to the end of discrimination. Exactly. We wouldn't have any problems. Right. But the research shows that when we, you know, attempt to be blind to color, we're also blind to discrimination. So I can give you an example oh, of, it, of yeah. this. So this was a, 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 an example of um, research that was conducted by you know several uh, researchers at, at, at Tufts, and they were interested in they were elementary school children, uh -huh. and because in schools, uh, school a lot of schools push this colorblind message. Teachers push it, the administrators push it. Be colorblind. Don't right. notice color. Right. And not right? from bad motives. So, from actually, not, from good from actually motives. very positive from motives. Good right. motives. Uh -huh. and, and I mean that's the whole thing about also being a social scientist, yeah. right, that, that, that we have all these intuitions about what works and exactly. what doesn't work, but when you put it to the test, sometimes you get surprising exactly. results. Um, so, so what they did, they took fourth and fifth graders, and um, to uh, some of the fourth and fifth graders, they gave them a message. They, they said, we all um, you know, are in favor of racial equality, we want to live with racial harmony, and so therefore, it's best not to notice color. It's best, it's best to be colorblind. And they took another group of fourth and fifth graders and said, started off the same way, right? Uh, we all are, care about racial harmony uh, and, and so forth. Right. And so it's best um, to value diversity. Right, yeah. Two really different messages. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, this, uh, the, these children were confronted um, with the story, right, of, of this child, a black child who was knocked down on a soccer field. I think he was sort of pushed down and punched or mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. like by another kid. And they said well, to this kid who did this, why did you do this? And, and the kid says, because he's black. Okay, so you think that that's like a blatant form of discrimination. He knows why he did it. He's saying why he did it. And it was because of his race. So you ask the children, is this discriminatory or not? Now, 80% of the children in the valuing diversity condition mm -hmm. of the study you know, when they're in that mindset, mm -hmm. they say, well, yeah, you know, this is discrimination. Mm -hmm. But only half of those students in the colorblind condition actually would identify that as discrimination. So th this is what the researchers mean by, you know, when we're teaching children not to notice color, right. they don't notice discrimination. They don't notice the inequality. Right. And, and what's worse is when th the teachers heard, you know, students talking about what mm -hmm. happened, when they heard the colorblind students talking about what happened, the teachers were less inclined to get involved. The teachers thought it was you know, not you know, a, a big deal that they wouldn't intervene. You know, so, so then you're leaving right. people who are discriminated against to kind of fend for themselves. Uh, right, right, right. And I think your broader point is, 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 is really important too, and it's another reason that I like, uh, I, I like the book so much, is that we have intuitions about Mm -hmm. how to do things and how to make things better. Yeah. Sometimes their intuitions are right, sometimes they're way off. Yeah. That's what science is for. <laughs> science it, is it for is. to sort of ferret out what we think is the truth at that moment. So you even found that, that diversity language doesn't always work the way that we think. So for instance, employers say, we prize diversity, we want diverse candidates applying, we welcome diverse right. candidates, and there's research showing that that doesn't work the way that we think it always does. It doesn't, and, and I think applicants who are, you know, you know people of color, for yeah. example, are worried about this and are, are aware that it doesn't always work in the way, um, you know, that, that they hope. And so th those students, uh, th these are um, college students yeah. in, in these studies, yeah. they've taken to what they call whitening the resume. I mean, it's so common that there's a term for it whitening the resume yeah. and 
researchers have looked at this with both African American college students and Asian students who are, um, you know, f finishing college and right. about to enter the job market, and right. they're worried about um, their race and preventing them from getting, uh, you know, the jobs that they apply but for. But the worry is understandable because th there's research showing that actually signaling yes. diversity, as much as organizations say they want that, signaling diversity can actually work against the candidate. Right, right, they've shown that. Yeah. So, so even signaling diversity, uh, right, with your name. Right. Um, so, and this is true for both African American yeah. and um, you know, sort of Asian uh, Americans who yeah. have names that don't sound uh, white, don't don't sound European or whatever. Um, so, right. So, so you the, so you have so you would have say an Asian student whose name might be Ji Young or Mei Lin, right. uh, uh, saying, "Well, no, I, for this for the purposes of this resume, I'm going to have a better chance right. if my name is Jessica or right. Joan." Right. And it turns out that they do. <laughs> Yep. Even for companies that, that say we yeah. value diversity, yeah. and for the, you know, the students who believe that, and, and it's okay, this, this company is signaling to me that they value diversity, that they're okay with me being non-white, um, you know, they, they actually get fewer callbacks yeah. from those potential employers. Yeah, that, that's one of those, even that phrase to me is so jarring, white, whitening the resume. But there are some small things, going back to solutions here for a moment, um, uh, talk talk about uh, empathy interventions right. uh, for students, uh, especially younger kids. Yeah, so this is um, re researchers. Actually, this is at my home institution at Stanford. There are a number of of, of researchers. Um, Jason Okwanifa, um, who was a graduate student at Stanford, he's actually now at, at UC Berkeley, and and um, Greg Walton and so mm -hmm. forth. They they did studies where they were interested in. Um, you know, uh, racial disparities in discipline. Um, so I had done some studies with uh, Jason uh, before this where we were showing, you know, that there was, you know, there was racial bias mm -hmm. there on the part of teachers and how they chose to discipline students. Right. So we would, you know, vary the race uh, systematically of, of, of the student and then describe some misbehavior and found that the teachers felt that the, you know, that the uh, misbehavior was more problematic when the student was black and that they wanted to discipline discipline that student more when he was black, especially if it was multiple uh, misbehaviors. And so they came up with uh, an intervention to uh, look at, uh, you know, this, mm -hmm. this discipline to try to, uh, you know, to, to minimize the, um, the, the, the racial uh, disparity there. And w what they did was just to have teachers uh, think about the act of uh, disciplining a student in a mm -hmm. different way. So mm -hmm. it's not a punitive thing. You're, you're disciplining a student to try to uh, help that student. You're, you're trying to um, you know, form a, a, a stronger relationship with that student because you care about the student. You're trying to guide the student and so forth. They, they ask them to uh, think about times when they were disciplined you know, by a teacher when they were mm -hmm. younger mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what impact that would have. Mm -hmm. And so they tried to put them in a whole other frame of mind. Yeah. They tried to change their mindset right. um, so that uh, they understood that that a primary goal right of a teacher is to form a relationship with a student and and you need empathy to do that and so they were trying to develop this empathy intervention um, such that they could curb um, you know the uh, the, the negative impact right. uh, of discipline. And they found that they were using this te technique that they were able to uh, cut the discipline uh, in half at, at five different schools across right. California. Right, so that's yeah. again another, another sign of hope. Another one yeah. is, uh, that you write about is um, how, at, at school level, how teachers give feedback. Yeah. The way we give feedback can mitigate some of this bias. Yes. Again, another researcher at Stanford yeah. and uh, looked at um, basically uh, this was a study where you uh, gave uh, students feedback on a paper, uh, but then you uh, put a post that note on that paper, you know, supposedly from from the from the teacher himself or mm -hmm, herself, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. she, but this was all sort of yeah, randomized, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. And so half of the of the papers with feedback got a post-it note that said, um, you know, I'm giving you this this feedback because I have high standards and I believe you can meet those standards. Mm -hmm. That's one condition. Right. Another condition of the study, they gave the feedback. It was real feedback from uh -huh, real teachers, uh -huh. but then a post-it on there placed on there. You know, supposedly by the teacher, but by a researcher mm -hmm. that said, "I'm giving you this feedback 
because I just want you to have, um, you know, uh, some comments on, on your paper. Right. And they found that what they call the wise feedback right. condition, where they were told, I have high standards and I believe you can meet them, that the students just responded in a, in a completely different way. They were more likely to revise the work. They were uh, more likely to, you know, to resubmit it. They got better grades later um, in the course. Um, they felt better about the teacher and about school. You know, it, it, um, it assuaged their concerns sure. about trust, you know, in, in the teaching environment. And, right. you know, and these are children, so the, the effects were strongest, right, with um, children of color, with African American uh, students, and with Latino students, and um, not much of an effect one way or another with white students. And the researchers believe that's because, um, you know, those students are already, they already trust the institution, right. you know, they already, you know, sort of right. feel comfortable there. Right. They're, they, they're not sort of suspicious. Uh, right. suspicious of the teacher's motives and, and so forth and so uh, and, and they're they're encouraged all the time they're given this sort of positive feedback all the time and so it's n nothing new really